This time, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about Newton's three laws of motion. And this is a very important idea that will carry through the entire physics course. Newton figured out that every object can only exist in one of two conditions. Either all the forces on it equal zero, or all of the forces on it do not equal zero. And he parlayed this into three basic laws of physics that are fundamental to understanding anything in physics. Now this is Newton's first law, and as a physics student, I think it is very important that you not only know the name of the law, you have to know which, what each one says. And you should know which one is the first, the second, or the third. It is that big a deal in physics. So here is Newton's first law. If the vector sum of the forces acting on an object equals zero, then the object will move at a constant velocity. This can be summarized saying, if the sum of the forces on an object equals zero, then it's going to have a constant velocity. Now if you recall when we were talking about velocity, velocity is defined as speed plus direction. So if something has a constant velocity, it can either be doing only one of two things. It is either moving in a straight line at a steady speed, or it's not moving in a particular frame of reference. These are the only two situations that can be true if all of the forces on an object equal zero. Newton's second law. Newton's second law says this. If the vector sum of the forces on an object do not equal zero, then the object is accelerating. And this can be simplified by saying if the sum of the forces on an object do not equal zero, then you're going to have acceleration. And if you remember what we talked about for acceleration, there are three ways to accelerate in physics. You can speed up, you can slow down, you can change directions. And all three of these involve some sort of non-zero force. So if you have acceleration, you have a non-zero force acting on you. Newton's third law is sometimes referred to as the action-reaction law. You may have heard it said this way, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And that's a very traditional way of saying it. I prefer this way of saying it. Forces always come in pairs, equal in size, opposite in direction, and acting on two different bodies. Let me explain. If I push on a wall, the wall's going to push back on me. If I push with 10 pounds of force, it's going to push back on me with 10 pounds of force. If I push with a 100 pounds of force, the wall's going to push back on me with a 100 pounds of force. Forces come in pairs, equal in size, opposite in direction, and acting on two different bodies. I push on the wall, the wall pushes on me. Here's another one. You might have a coffee cup or a book that's sitting on a table. The force of gravity is the book has weight, and because the book has weight, it is pushing down on the table. The table is pushing up on the book with exactly the same force. Those two forces are equal and opposite. Now, and this works even if you've got a book on a table or if you've got a, a, a big weird monster sitting on a table. This will work until you get past the limit of the materials. If you are talking about a, uh, a table or a wall or whatever, if you push f with a harder, bigger force, then it can push back. That when That is when you get breakage occurring. Here's another one. Action-reaction force. Now, how does this person go forward on their skateboard? They push on the ground, and the ground pushes back on them. Lots of examples of Newton's third law. We're going to spend a little time now talking about and using each one of these laws, and we're going to identify some forces. So if you're sitting in a chair right now, there is a force of gravity pushing up, uh, excuse me, down on you. And what force or what prevents you from falling straight down towards the ground? Well, it's probably the chair. There is a supporting upward force 
caused by the chair, which in physics we call a normal force. A normal force is the supporting force of a surface. There are so many of these supporting forces of a surface. Um, if I am standing on the ground, well, then the ground is going to support me. Um, if I have a, uh, a book that's sitting on the top of my car, well, then the car is going to support the book. Because there are so many of these, there's one generic name that's used all the time, and that is called normal force, force sub n for normal. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface, so there's always going to be a 90 degree angle between the surface and the upward force. Now right now, are you in a Newton's first law situation or are you in a Newton's second law situation? Well, how do we determine that? In the first law, the sum of the forces on the object equals zero and there's a constant velocity. Second law, some of the forces on an object do not equal zero and you've got some sort of an acceleration. I suspect right now you are sitting on a chair and the sum of the forces on you are going to equal zero. That's how I know that the force of gravity down is going to be exactly the same as the normal force. Now, you and I probably don't weigh the same amount. You may be you know, 20 pounds lighter, 100 pounds lighter, 50 pounds heavier. People come in all sorts of different weights. But how the heck does the chair know that it's supposed to push up with a force that's equal to the force of gravity? Well, the chair's not smart. That's Newton's third law. Forces come in pairs, equal in size, opposite in direction. Gravity pulls down on you, chair pushes up on you. That's a Newton's first law situation and you're moving at a constant velocity. Now have you ever sat in an old-fashioned one of those kind of chairs? I'm usually the one at the picnic who sits in the wrong chair and you've got your little plate of potato salad and beans and all of a sudden you sit in that chair and what happens? You go and you end up sitting on the dirt and trying to save your potato salad. Well, if you sit on a broken chair, gravity is still pushing down on you, but the normal force is not big enough from this broken chair to support all of your weight. So if you have an unbalanced force, the force of gravity is bigger than the normal force, you are going to have an acceleration. Where are you going to accelerate? Well, in this case, you're going to fall down. And you're going to fall down because there is a net or an unbalanced force on you. The force that is bigger is going to accelerate you in the direction of that unbalanced force. You are now in a Newton's second law situation and you have an unbalanced force on you. Okay, let's talk about a whole bunch of examples involving cars. Let's say you've got a car and it's just not moving right now. It's at rest, it's in your garage, it's in a parking lot, it's just sitting out there. So here you've got a car. Let's name all the forces that could be on this car. So we have force of gravity. Gravity always acts straight down towards the center of the earth. The pavement or road is supporting the force up and that is the normal force. If the car is not moving, is there any force making it go forward or backward? No. If the car is at rest, it is in a Newton's first law situation and the sum of the forces on it equals zero. The normal force equals the force of gravity and that's an example of the first law. Now let's say that you're going to accelerate forward. You're at a stop sign and you're about to accelerate forward. We still have force of gravity down. We still have the surface, the force of normal up. But there is some force that makes your car move forward. What is it? Well, it's a complicated thing um, involving engines and drivetrain and wheels pushing on the road and all sorts of different things. We are going to bundle all of those in one big force and we're going to call it force applied. And force applied is very often abbreviated FA and that is a big force. That force is pulling you forward. Now what opposes motion or goes in the opposite direction? Friction. There are frictional forces between the tires and the road. There are frictional forces between the car and the air. Again, we are not going to tease those out separately right now. We're just going to call them the force of friction. But if you're accelerating forward, 
you know the sum of the forces on you do not equal zero, and you will accelerate in the direction of the unbalanced force. So force applied is larger than the force of friction, so you're going to accelerate vroom, forward. Let's talk about being on the highway on cruise control. So you're going down a nice straight stretch of highway. Gravity, yep, gravity still exists. It's still pulling you down. Normal force is pushing you up. And as long as you are not driving on a, a mud bog somewhere, these two forces most of the time are going to be equal. But let's talk about the forces necessary to keep you going at a constant velocity on a straight stretch of road. You get your car up to speed, and then you set your cruise control. The force applied is not as big as was necessary when you were first accelerating your car. Let me ask you this question. Where do you get the best mileage? Do you get the best mileage on the highway, or do you get the best mileage in town when you're doing a lot of start and stop motion? Well, yeah, you get the best mileage in your car on the highway. And the reason is because the force applied only has to be big enough to overcome the force of friction. These two are equal. And you might say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I am on the highway and I'm going 70 miles an hour. How can I have all the forces on me equal zero if I am still moving? Remember, one of the versions of constant velocity is moving in a straight line at a steady speed. So you could be on a straight highway on cruise control, and the only work your little engine has to do is overcome the little force of friction between the road and between the air. Now, if you have an in-town driving um, and you are starting and stopping all the time, we know we get terrible mileage because at every stoplight, you have to take your 4,000 pounds of car and you have to accelerate it from zero velocity up to, let's say, 40 miles per hour before you hit the next stop sign. So this is a huge change in velocity. That takes an awful lot of work from your engine, and it also takes an awful lot of gasoline. Now let's describe coming to a stop. Stop signs here. Gravity is still down. Normal force is still up. And what other force is acting on you? Now stop and think for a moment. What do you do with your feet and the pedals when you are coming to the stop sign? Yeah, you take your foot off the gas and you put your foot on the brakes. The brakes produce friction. Now, is there any force applied making you go forward? No, because remember you took your feet off the gas. You do not have your feet on the gas pedal anymore, but yet your car is moving towards the stop sign. Holy moly, what makes the car go th towards the stop sign? Do you remember inertia? The concept of an object wanting to keep doing what it is already doing. And inertia is not a force. It is a tendency for matter to keep doing what it's doing. So when you're coming to a stop, the only forces acting on your car are normal and gravity, and these two probably are equal unless you're going through a mud bog, and friction. So you apply an unbalanced force, you're in a Newton's second law situation, and the sum of the forces on you do not equal zero. So you are undergoing a negative acceleration. Big idea, make sure you write this down. A net or an unbalanced force is required to change the motion of an object, to make it start moving, make it stop moving. If you want to change the motion of an object, you must apply a net or an unbalanced force. Net force, unbalanced force, those are interchangeable words and depends on your book exactly which one they're going to say. All right, that will do for now. See you later. Bye. <laughs>